This session that I'm about to do has a tendency to overrun, and I'm very aware that I stand between you and lunch. So I'm going to make a start. Welcome, thanks for coming. Uh, extra thanks to those of you who came back yesterday and weren't put off coming to a second uh, session of mine. This one is about becoming a parameter ninja. Um, and we're going to try and do naught to ninja in 45 minutes, which might be pushing it a bit. I'm James O'Neill, uh, contact details on the slide and a QR code for my blog. Uh, for those of you that are, haven't heard me say it before, uh, I worked for Microsoft for a while. Um, I've been out of Microsoft for long enough to have almost <laughs> recovered. And I now work freelance, um, Mobular Consulting being the, uh, uh, the name of my little personal service company. Um, so, very simple agenda, a little bit of context, uh, and then I'm going to go, kind of go basic, intermediate, advanced ninja level. So that's the, uh, the plan. A um, little bit of context. Um, getting parameters right isn't just for new users. Um, you kind of hear developers sometimes go, oh, people will get used to the way I've done this. Actually, getting parameters right is good for experienced users as well. There's a famous quote about seeing laws made. Um, I had a look to try and find the original source. I was told it was Mark Twain, then I was told it was Benjamin Franklin. These things always get assigned to Winston Churchill, but apparently it comes from Bismarck, which I didn't know. And the original quote was, if you like law or sausages, you shouldn't see either of them being made. Well, the same applies to the output of a function. Okay? Nobody cares what goes on inside. They care about the bits they interact with. So we're trying to make the bits that people interact with a little bit better. Um, I talked a lot yesterday about formatting and adding things onto objects. This is all about the input side. Um, so, stuff that we, we, we probably all should know, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, but whiz through this quite quickly. Um, names of parameters. Try and stick to the ones people already know. Um, I know that everybody has got their own idea what you should call the path parameter. And if you can have two or three different path parameters, that's obviously better than one. No, it isn't, but that's kind of how things have come to be. Aliases are a great help for parameters. I was talking to somebody or in a conversation with somebody, it might have been Mike Robbins, who was saying that uh, he's working with people who are really concerned about ever having to change the name of a parameter. And of course, if you ever change the name of the parameter, just create an alias for the old name. You can also create aliases that will disambiguate short names. So if you've got two, short, two parameters which condense down to the same couple of letters, and then aren't unique, well, you can make one of those an alias. And for things like pass-through or password, PT for pass-through, PW for password, and that kind of thing. And if you've got, just got name, then name of what it is, sometimes that's helpful as well. Um, something that irks me whenever I see it, when, when somebody else does it, is when you look at the parameters for a function, if you think of a function being sort of verb, noun, one of the parameters is the, um, I was going to say the object of the verb. I think it's the subject of the verb. My grammar's suddenly deserted me. It's the subject of the verb. So it's what we're working on. And then the rest of the parameters describe the work that we're going to do. So you know, it's the file that we're going to copy, then it's the destination, that sort of thing. And the target really should accept multiple values, both via the pipeline or as a comma-separated list. And the number of things that you see where there's either no pipeline input, fail, go away, make it power shelly, come back when you've done the job properly, or it only accepts one. And it's quite easy to just go, for each I in input, do this in a loop. So should really try to, to make sure that the, the tar we accept multiple targets. And um, other parameters, if they align with names of properties, well, try and, try and match them up either directly through the names or through aliases. And that then helps when we come to use the uh, value from pipeline by property name tag on a parameter. Now, a couple of things on types. Um, and a whole range of hills that I might die on. Um, one is around writing things for users. Users do not want to hand you an object of the type that you're working on. <coughs> okay? If you make them go away and do get thing so that you can pass the right 
object into your, into your function, you're doing it wrong. You should be able to pass the name, the ID, or an object representing the thing as the, uh, in, in exactly the same way. You're the one that's, that's, that's got the programming skills. You should be able to do the conversion. You shouldn't put that on the user. That's one. Second one is Boolean parameters are always wrong. There is never an excuse for using a Boolean parameter. <laughs> I actually do this sometimes, but to, to all intents and purposes, Boolean parameters should not be there. You, they should always be a switch for the non-default case. There is a slight issue around doing this that sometimes you want to be able to say, for example, set a user and set the state of that user to be disabled. So you have a minus disabled switch. And normally you wouldn't be changing that state from enabled to disabled. But sometimes you might want to change it back from disabled to enabled. And then you end up with switch colon false as an option. And people don't generally know that one very well, and that creates a little bit of a usability headache. So occasionally you can pardon the use of a Boolean, but generally to be avoided. And a lot of people who come from other programming languages don't, re don't realize that when you specify a type, you're basically saying, convert this. You're not saying the parameter must be of that type. And the conversions don't always make sense. A um, couple of things to just show you on that front. So here's a nice, simple example. Come on. So first version of a, um, a function here. It's called v1 for obvious reasons. Takes a parameter. If the parameter is null, we say it was empty. Otherwise, we say we got a parameter. So we run that. And you can see down the bottom, version one says the parameter was empty. Then my, uh, my lovely colleague comes along and says, oh, well, that's a, that parameter is always a string. So they make one change, and they say it's of type string. OK. And now, when that's converted, it converts no input to being an empty string. And an empty string isn't null. There's a difference between null and empty string. So depending on what tests I've done deep in the, in the function, somebody comes along and changes that because they say, oh, everything should be typed. Just breaks things. Now, anybody here not from North America? Oh, good. OK. You might have some idea what's coming here then. Um, the rest of you who, who are from North America, you might like to think that when it comes to date formatting, you have won first prize in the lottery of life. <laughs> Not because it is smart to put the least significant part in the middle, but because that's what's the standard for invariant culture. So my culture, I'm set for uh, British English here. Uh, and I write the day first like God intended. <laughs> and um, the, uh, so I've got a function here. User date. OK. User date takes a date parameter. So we've said it's system date time. It's not a D. It returns D. What could be, what could be simpler? OK. So we've defined that function. We have defined that function. And down here, I'm just going to check how we get the, the date parameter on two different commands. PowerShell's built-in get date and my freshly designed user date. Okay? In both cases, they are date time. So if I do get date and use date with the same date, you'd expect me to get the same thing out, wouldn't you? No. I can't tell you why that is. There is a, there, somebody did explain to me the error that's deeply baked into PowerShell, but Get date will treat the date as local culture, and if you create a function, it's invariant culture. So you go, oh, well, that's OK. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll make it a string, OK? <laughs> so we'll take the input as a string, and I know that convert uses local culture, not invariant culture. So we'll do define that function. 
we'll get a date. So we'll do the same thing. We'll pass that to user date. And oh, hang on a minute. That was the fifth, of the fifth day of the fourth month. And when we converted that, it got converted the wrong way around because I've said this is, a, this is a, a date going in here. When I've said cast the date to a string, it said, oh, you want me to do that with invariant format. And so this has actually transformed that date the wrong way as well. So date parameters, you might be better off just letting the parameter come into the function, examining its type, and writing some code inside the function to deal with it appropriately. So some conversions, are, as I say, are, are just not logical. Um, there used to be some really horrible ones with, with files as well. Um, newer versions of .NET seem to have, seem to have ironed some of those out. Um, last one of the basics, um, defaults and, and mandatory parameters. If a function won't work without it, you're going to have to provide a value one way or the other. Either it's a mandatory parameter, you make the user provide it, or you specify a sensible default. There is no excuse, I'm sorry, another hill I'm going to die on, but there's no excuse for making the user type in something where you could assume a parameter that will work in 80, 90% of all cases. Right? Don't make somebody specify a directory if current directory will usually work. Okay? That's a fairly obvious one. And of course you're all writing good help. No, of course we're not, we're developers. But help should say what assumptions you're going to make. Okay, let's. Oh, I've done that one already. Have I just managed to go back a slide? Yes, that's why. I somehow went back. Okay, so back onto switches. Um, I've had this with, with, with data stuff and, and various other places, and it's something I call putting the value in the value. Uh, a switch is specifying some kind of non-default behavior. Okay? So typical case, we've got a function that, that sends something somewhere. I don't care, don't care what it is, but we've, we've got the option to send it at high priority. And then somebody comes along and says, ah, but there's a low priority. And at this point, we've broken things because we've now got two switches as two parameters to specify two values for the same thing, i.e. priority. Really, we should have priority high and priority low. Yeah? We shouldn't have two different switches. And quite often, you can see things that build up, and they start really logical, because that, that first one, send high priority, that makes complete sense. You know, the, You'd, you'd want, no, that doesn't work. You'd want somebody, that's why, I need to do that. No. Scrub that. You'd want somebody to be able to say high priority. But what we don't want to do is build up the, this massive list of things. Now, there's an example here, and I feel slightly guilty because... The person whose code this is, is actually in the room, but he did accept a pull request from me to, to change this, so I'm going to show this anyway. <laughs> this was doing some t testing. If anyone's come across Selenium, uh, Selenium's a, a web testing framework that lets you find elements that have been returned on a web page and see if they match what they're supposed to be. And there are a bazillion ways of finding them. So the natural thing that happens is you say, well... I want to find it this way, 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 and they're all in their own parameter sets, so we can't duplicate it, so we can't put in more than one. And then in the body of the function, we say, if you specified this one, find it this way. If you specified that one, find it that way. Actually, it's much easier if you just write, there are these ways you can find it, so choose a way to find it. Here's a default. This is the selection. And then the rest of it was the same as before. And then all the, all the rest of the stuff just come, becomes that one little piece there. 
So we've got rid of parameter sets, and trust me, getting rid of a lot of parameter sets is good for your sanity. We'll see more of that in a bit. We've got the switch statement down to a single command, and in order to make the to stop the previous um, format from going wrong, we added some parameter aliases, or I added some parameter aliases, and looked at the command line so we could spot the old version of the command um, running, and we could you, we could still work with the old syntax. So that's the first of the intermediate topics. Second one is on validation, and um, I have a slide that's just appearing there that I've been using for more years than I really should have been. I think I've, I first used this slide in 2011, um, and it's to do with validation. Now, there are two important things on validation, and you might have picked up a bit of attitude from me on, on this kind of stuff already, but the job of validation is to prevent stuff getting in that could never possibly be right in any shape or form. It's not there as a crutch for lazy programmers. Every bit of web validation I seem to see is a crutch for lazy programmers. Anyone got a, else got an apostrophe or a hyphen in their name? No. Yeah? But number of websites I go to that say, you cannot put in a surname of O'Neill because names can only contain letters. Right? Woe betide you if you've got an accented character in your name or a hyphen or an apostrophe. Um, and things like... Um, phone numbers can't have spaces in, credit card numbers can't have spaces in. You've got all this compute resource, how difficult is it to strip spaces out exactly? Anyhow, that's the job of validation. When things fail validation, we need to try and help the user. This one doesn't, okay? I don't know how well you can see that, but it's put up a... Put up a um, a description of how the uh, of, a, of a regular expression that the input needs to match. So I've got an, a slightly updated version of that, which is here. So here we go. I've written a validate pattern. We're all experts here. Who can tell me what that pattern is quickly? Come. Yes. Thank you, Kevin. So we've got, we got something that says, here, here's a GUID. So we'll run this validate one. OK, we'll pass it an argument of one, two, three, four. And I hope you can see at the bottom here, it, it says, the argument one, two, three, four does not match the pattern. <laughs> Supply an argument that matches the pattern. Well, good luck if you're an end user. Because you ain't going to understand that. You have not got an earthly. OK, so let's go to a slightly better version. I'll use a script. OK, so the validate script says do the same, same thing, but this time return match. Well, we've improved it now. We've said the script dollar underscore minus match, something completely incomprehensible, failed. Figure out why it failed and have another go. I think you get where I'm coming from. Well, that script, because it's a script block, it can throw an exception. So how about we say in there something meaningful? I'm not quite sure. I seem to have an extra apostrophe in there, but it doesn't, shouldn't matter. I think I've run this once before. There we go. So cannot valid validate parameter ID. ID must be a GUI. Hallelujah. We actually give the user something they can understand. Now, in the newer versions of PowerShell, so this is no good if you're targeting uh, Windows PowerShell um, 5 and earlier. You can actually specify an error message um, property for the validate pattern um, parameter decorator. So now, this one, validate four, you can get the same effect, okay, exactly the same thing, but that's only any good if you, you know you're only targeting PowerShell 7. If you, know you, if you suspect that this might ever run on PowerShell 5, that, that will actually cause an error before it even runs. So just to give you the, the comparison across all of them, that's what they all 
look like? He says. It should be more than that, but there you go. So that's validation and trying to get validation to make sense for the poor user. Okay, next one. It's a tense moment. Does the clicker work? Does it? It will just be the brief moment of swearing and thumping the hardware while I try and work out why... Yeah. Oh. It's got no idea what's, what it wants to put up this time. Right, let's try that again. Right, so just going back to um, the priority one that I'm showing before, <coughs> really helpful actually if you define an enum. So um, enumeration types like this, we can specify high, medium and low as the names of different values. They've got a value option and enums basically are a, are a piece of text and a number simultaneously. So they've got this dual personality. Um, sorry, I completely sidetracked myself there. Um, I mean, there's, a, there's a very famous person in England who won't be known internationally, and there's just something that he famously said about someone having a dual personality, and I hate both of them. Um, <laughs> and I, just the thought of them having a dual personality there. Um, those of you who've never come across John Cooper Clark, if you ever hear of him again, that's, that's where that comes from. Anyhow, an enum here gives me three things in one. I get shorthands because I can specify my priority as one, two, or three, or high, medium, and low. I get validation of my user input, and I get automatic completion. So validation, enums are a really helpful thing to have in the background. Um, we'll, we'll see enums in one of the examples that's coming up. And the final thing is, um, for, for intermediate, is the first stage of adding argument completers. I'm a huge believer in argument completers. I've been going on about them for years. And they, are, they fit in a neat gap where we're not doing validation. So if we use something like validate set, that will help us tab complete the values. If we have an enum, that will help us tab complete the values. But if we put anything in outside that set, it's an error, OK? What sometimes we want is, for filling in things like file names, we might want um, suggestions, but not enforcement. Um, so sometimes tab completion comes with validation. Sometimes uh, it doesn't. And it helps get the input right. Now, that's good for users. It makes you look good. Everything works better. Time saved. It's, it's a win all round. So a very quick first one on validators. I have got a little function here, and making this fit a sufficiently large text is going to be just a wee bit of a problem. But yes. So at the, t at the top here, I'm defining some namespaces just to keep this simpler. And I've got a function here called printer name completer function. Now, these completers always take the same arguments. So the command, the parameter, what's being completed, something called fake bound parameter, which is the other parameters on the line, and then you can see the abstract syntax tree of what, what's being called. Uh, and I have never, in all the time that I've been doing this, had a use for the abstract syntax tree in here. So 
I define a wild card, which is the word to complete with a star either side of it, and then I go and find installed printers that match the wild card. So if I load all of this lot, I'm just going to load my function, my two functions first of all. And right now, if I run my command my print one and try and tab complete, you'll see it just goes through the the files that are available. But if I say I want to register an argument completer, so I'm going to register an argument completer for my print, and the, the name is going to be name, and I'm just going to refer to the function to get the script block for it. So I'll run that. And now if I do the same thing, my print one, and start, oh, my argument completer just said my print, didn't it? Not my print once. We'll try that again. And this time, we'll do my print one and start tabbing. And you can see it now pulls up the names of my printers. Okay, so that, that's quite, quite a useful, useful trick. Okay, there's a second syntax for doing this, and you can see that what I've done here is I've actually invoked the function with the battery of arguments that, that got passed here, and I've put the whole thing inside a script block inside the brackets. That alternate syntax is going to come up a bit later. Uh, it's what I call the ugly syntax, and you'll see why I call it the ugly syntax when we get to that. So... Yes. No, it no it registers the, it registers the script block. So it depends. Sorry, let me on, let me repeat the question. So the question was, is the list frozen when I register the completer? And the answer is no, it's not. The script block is frozen when I run the completer. And then that script block goes and gets the information every, every time. Okay, so it depends a little bit on how you write the script block, but usually the script block is smart enough to say, go get the data fresh every time. Some of them, some of the completers I've written, do do some caching so that the first time they run, they go and fetch a set of options from the server, but it's always the first time that they complete not when they not when they're registered. So, oh yes, right. So we've just done adding completers. The next one uh, is one of the advanced options, and it comes at a small risk to your sanity. I did once do a talk called something like How I Stopped Worrying and Learned to Love Parameter Sets. Um, parameter sets, I have to say, are one of the things that I just don't like doing even when they're necessary. Um, the function of a parameter set, and we saw it on that piece of code I showed earlier, is to prevent impossible combinations of parameters being entered. There are two main challenges with this. The first is the proliferation of sets, and we'll see this in the, in the demo on the, on the next slide, but if A or B are allowed, well, that's just two sets, one, for, one with A in and one with B in. If you also say an X or Y are allowed, as well as A or B, now we've doubled it. And if you then say, yeah, you can have P, Q, or R, we've doubled it and then trebled it. So now we're at 12 sets. So that's one problem. The other problem is, ensuring that for every permutation of input that you might want to allow, there is something that will allow PowerShell to, to figure out this is the parameter set that I should be using. Um, tagging parameters as mandatory, and occasionally, even when you know there's no remote possibility that they'll come from the pipeline as a property value, using value from pipeline by property, value, by pro property name, actually gets you out of a hole, and we'll see some of those on the next one. 
the, the drawback with, with um, setting parameter values with the PS default parameter values um, global variable is that when you run the command, the values are always stuffed into the command, and that sometimes wrong foots the evaluation of parameter sets. So let's have a look at this one, parameter sets, which is the pizza. Because I, I haven't seen anybody do a pizza scenario so far this week, and it's about time somebody did, so it looks like it's going to be me. So... Um, I'm a little worried about the size of the screen here. I'm just going to make that a size smaller. And, I, and is that still reasonably legible? Right, OK. So first, come on. First iteration, oh, that's why. First iteration of this. So you can see I'm using an enum for my, my pizzas. I've got a very simple function here, OK? And we say, we've got the size. Um, we'll take size from the pipeline. We've got a default value. We've got one switch for extra cheese. And we just spit out what size it is and whether or not there's extra cheese. So if I run that, you can see at the bottom I've got a number of workable permutations here. I can do multiple orders in one. So you can see. Um, Oh, just here, by the way, if you didn't know that you can call a, a, a get operation in PowerShell omitting the get on the front of it, well, there's a piece of news for you. you can just, I can just run get pizza as pizza. So I've got a default order. I've got multiple orders. And I've got a, uh, a quick order. Okay. And you can see the different options coming down here. And they all seem to work fine. So I'll come along to a second one. And it's a bit like the, uh, the thing I showed with priorities earlier. We've now got switches for extra cheese and no cheese. And that all looks fine, except that we can specify them both together. OK, so you can see the last option that I ran here. So we can add cheese. We can specify no cheese. And we can specify them both together. Well, that's, that's not going to work. So somebody says, well, that's easy enough. Now we want parameter sets. So I create a parameter set for those two choices. But not everything will work. Because before, I could just order a pizza and say, I want a family size pizza. But now, those two options being specified like that break the assumption that this one can be passed by position without giving its name. So I've got to go back and change that. So we'll fix that. So we'll come along and say, that's now can be passed by position. Do that. So now that's working. Except that works. We can see at the bottom, calling pizza family size, extra cheese, that's, that's all good. But if I just call pizza family size, there's an error because nothing in the parameters that I've given so far lets PowerShell decide which of those two parameter sets it's in. So I need to fiddle that one. So fifth iteration. I can say there's an extra parameter set, default. And if nothing leads me into that parameter set, then all should be good. So that. Let's run that one. That seems to work, so that's good. But if we specify the default set explicitly, so up here I've said medium can be in any of those sets, it's all broken again. And the reason it's broken is nothing that's there tells PowerShell if you've just got... Um, the size, if those two are missing, you can make an assumption that it's the default set. Okay. In order to fix that, I need to say that those are mandatory members of the set. Okay. So, I go come back and do that again. Now, 
everything's working, except that we can't pipe things in anymore. OK, so now I can specify my family size pizza without saying what cheese I want on it. But when I go to pipe things in, the absence of these parameters here doesn't help PowerShell decide that we're in the default parameter set. And that's where, whoop, come to this last one. That's where we actually say value from pipeline by property name helps. So if I run that one, now I've got the pipeline working again. So those are some of the, some of the little bits to go over. And I talked about proliferation. So for proliferation, let me just show you what happens if we say we're going to want to say people can specify a vegetarian pizza or they can add pepperoni. This is what happens to our parameter sets. And this is why sometimes you go, you know what, I'm never going to get this done entirely with parameter sets. I'm just going to have to write some code inside the function that says this is not a legal combination. Because this is getting a little bit hard to manage. And by the way, those names are case sensitive. Most things in PowerShell aren't. But one little typo in there, and you've created a parameter set that you didn't intend to have. So that's parameter sets. How's the time going? Oh, we're going to run out of time. Surprise, surprise. So I'm not going to do the demonstration for. I'm not going to do the demonstration for <coughs> dynamic parameters. I'm, I'll just explain a little bit, a bit about dynamic parameters. They are something of a, um, a sanity risk as well, perhaps even more so than um, parameter sets. The best advice I can give you is going to come up in red in a second. Um, and dynamic parameters. I've, o I've only found a couple, of, a couple of cases where I really need to use them. The downside on dynamic parameters is, t is twofold. The first is, when you go and ask PowerShell for a list of available commands, it expands the available parameters. And if you have dynamic parameters, it goes and figures out what the dynamic parameters are. I did some work with somebody else's module because their performance had got really, really horrible. If that module was loaded and you did get minus tab, there was about a 20-second delay before you got the first command come up. And what was happening was all the, they had a whole raft of about 100 dynamic parameters, all of which were making server queries. So we were making 100 API calls to, the, to servers sequentially, populating these dynamic parameters. And then we didn't do anything with it. We just said, OK, and now we know what all the commands are available are. So that was the performance hit. They're quite difficult to, to follow and debug. Um, that's why I'm not going to do the demo, because it, it takes too long to explain. And unlike normal parameters, you don't get the automatic dollar parameter name in the, in the body of the function. You have to access them through PS bound parameters. The two use cases I've got for them, one is where you say, I have this function which is going to call all the same parameters as this other function. I just want to copy them. And the second is, if the value of parameter, one parameter, changes the values available for another parameter, then dynamic parameters will do that for you. But I'm going to skip the demo of that one. Yes, <laughs> there, are, there are some cases, and, and the, other ca the other case, actually, that you, you do see in, power, in the core parts of PowerShell itself are there are some functions based on the operating system. There are other functions that are based on what the current drive is, where you, where you would say, I do not want these parameters to appear. For example, if I am... Um, doing a directory on the function drive instead of a file system drive. Okay, So there are cases like that, um, but the, 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 the use cases that I've hit have been just the two on the slide. Um, 
the embedded completers, I'll, 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 sh I'll show you very quickly. This is what I was talking about, ugly syntax. Um, we've got the parameter, the valid various different validate and allow labels that we can attach to parameters in a param block. Um, there's a new one that came in with PowerShell version 5, which is argument completer, which we saw earlier. Now, what you can do with the argument completer is you can put the whole of the function code in there. So, when I showed you this before, here we had a script block that said, call this function with a set of arguments. Now, I've got a version called completer as ugly here. <coughs> okay, so I've got my parameter, which contains an argument completer decorator for uh, he says, for this parameter here, name, and in between, I've put the whole of that function. Okay, so basically, this block from that brace to that brace is all part of creating that argument completer. I don't know about you, but I find that in, a, in the middle of a param block just makes the whole thing hard to read. So it's available as an option, but don't do it. Because there are better ways, and we're going to come to those. So, the better ways are using classes. And this is where we get to ninja level. So, PowerShell classes... Um, a few people are put off by classes. Um, they're, they're not especially difficult. And once, once you've written the fir first one or two, they, they're, they're really quite straightforward. Um, because of some strange loading behavior with, um, with the way PowerShell um, processes modules, classes are much better off being in the PSM1 file than anywhere else. And if you try and dot source them into the PSM1 file, they don't work. So just write them in your PSM1 file and then load the PSM1 from the PSD file. You can write the class in PowerShell or C Sharp. Um, the, the style is very similar. If you think you're going to move over to compiled commandlets written in C Sharp, start in C Sharp. If not, start, stay in PowerShell. And they can be completers, validators, transformers, and from version 6 and later, we have one for creating a, um, a dynamic parameter set. So, I just want to show you what this looks like with that completer that I had before. So, come on. There we go. That was a big sight. So, here it was as a function, okay? So we took the parameters and we did the work. And as a PowerShell class, it's basically there is the same thing as a method defined in that class. Nice, easy template to fill in. The rest of it's exactly the same, except we're more explicit about returning the result. And now when we call it, we just put the name of the class there with square brackets around it. So if I do the same thing as I did before, load that, and if I do my print 3, I can tab complete that, and you can see, again, it's just going through a list of my printers. So that all looks quite good. Um, just for completeness, here's what it looks like as a C-sharp class. So the same declarations, if I, with a screen this size, it's a little bit harder to do the sort of toggle between them and show how similar they are, but it's the same declarations, the same function, or the same method signature here, and then basically the same block of code in the middle, just a slightly different way of saying we want to process wildcards for C-sharp's purposes. Okay, so same sort, of, um, same sort of process, just three different ways of specify them, and you can create a function that calls the class to then bind uh, with um, register argument completer. The second one is transformers. So 
A transformer, no, it's not that wonderful kid's toys, um, but a transformer basically says, the user has given us something that's not completely broken, we can make sense of it, but it's not in the form that we accept. Okay, so we might want to take spaces out of a phone number or credit cards, convert an object from a name to a GUID, um, change shortcuts. I've got a really nice argument completer that I, I use with, the, with um, CD and various other commands that will let me put in shortcuts for different paths on the system. And if the transformer can't make sense of it, there's always the option to throw. So I was showing you the um, completion. Here's a transformer for um, the, the printers again. And basically, it says, if the input data is, a, is an existing printer, just send it back. Otherwise, see if we can match it against a printer. And if we can't match it against a printer, throw an error. Whoa. Thank you. Everybody's too polite to say that. People should be going, you're on the slide, you idiot. Get out of, get out of the slide. So, yeah, so the transformer basically says, if the, if the input value was a printer, return it. If it's not, if we can't match it against a printer, throw an error. If we can match against a printer, fantastic, return the matching printer. So if I, if I run this, I've got, still got my completer attribute there, but I'm now going to add the transformer attribute. So I do. my print three. So I can tab through those, and you can see I've got my, my brother printer there. So that works. But if I just type brother, well, that's interesting. Shouldn't have done that. No. It should be coming back and resolving that. What's interesting is definitely done that. This worked in preparation. It's not going to work now. Uh, that's intriguing. <coughs> what this did when I was preparing it before Okay, I know what's happened. Go away. It does not want to play that particular game with me. Okay, well, that's a really... Um, really bad way to bring the demos to an end. But the, the, what a transformer would normally do, in fact, let me show you, show you something different. So I've got this um, thing that I've done for, I was just mentioning for CD. So I can do something like CD three dots and go up two levels, okay? Now, if I do CD three dots and tab complete it, it'll actually say, oh, you mean dot dot slash dot dot. But the three dots there isn't normally a valid path. What the transformer has done is the transformer has done the same thing as the tab expansion would do and converted three dots into dot, dot, slash, dot, dot. Okay, and I've got all sorts of clever things in there. I can go something like CD tilde tilde my pictures or pick and select my pictures. And if I put that in, that's obviously not a valid path, but the transformer will make it a valid path. Okay, that's what a, what a transformer does, um, even if the demo one didn't work. And then the final one on those is custom validators. Now, the, the, the job of a custom validator is exactly what it says. It's write your own validator, but do it as a class. So where the completer just sent back possible values, 
the transformer changed the value and potentially threw an error, the job of the, uh, of the validator is basically throw an error or come back. That's all it does. It's slightly more awkward for a validator to find out the other parameters. For anybody that needs to find them, uh, I've put, them, put that on the slide. PS bound parameters doesn't exist when the, when the custom validator is running. And you can only see the parameters that come before you on the command line because they have been bound and they're available in my invocation. So you can see what a what, what's um, available to um, a validator. And just to, to show the same thing that I was using before very quickly, if I can escape from the presentation. Um, I've got a validator that I'm using for CD. So if I do something like CD star dot star, it actually comes back and the validator says, I don't know how legible that is, but it says, you've, you've given me something that resolves to multiple items. I can't possibly change into multiple directories. So that's the job of a validator. OK. We made it to the end, and we've only overrun by five minutes. So quick summary. From the stuff we saw at the beginning, first off, try and match users' expectations. That's names. Accept the stuff that the user wants to send you. Save the user work. Good defaults, completers, transformers, all do that. Parameter sets and dynamic parameters help you get the input correct, and making the validation smart does the same. And classes just extend the capabilities of what you can do. We're done. Anyone feel like a ninja now? <laughs>